when you think of God, what do you think? Is he some big grandfather upstairs, as people would say, waiting to bless you? Or some judge sitting on a throne, ready to, in some way, torment you? What's your image of God? I can hear you now. You say, I don't believe in God. Yes, you do. You may not be willing to admit it. And the reason you don't want to admit it is because you don't like the idea of how you think you'd have to live if you believed in God. So I want you to turn, if you will, to Romans chapter 1 for a moment. And I want us to listen to what God said concerning His presence and what is true of all mankind, no matter who they are. And so when people tell you, I don't believe in God. In fact, it's interesting that I've had two mothers tell me in the last six weeks that their sons said, uh, Mom, I don't believe in God anymore. I said, what did you tell him? Well, I didn't know what to tell him. Well, I said, well, you need to tell him to read Romans chapter 1. Because you see, people decide they don't believe in God because they don't like God. With the way you have to live if you're going to live a life of obedience. What they don't realize is what they're doing to themselves is disastrous. Now, look in verse 18 of Romans chapter 1. Very important. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They hold it down. Because that which is known about God, look at this, that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his characteristics, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen all that's evident, clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. You can tell God you don't believe in him, but you're without excuse. You can tell other people you don't believe in him, but you don't have an excuse in God's eyes. For Listen, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools. And on the scripture goes. So now when you think about God, what do you think about? So the whole purpose of this message is we're talking about the idea of convictions. What convictions do you have? We've talked about the idea of convictions and the convictions you have about the Bible. See, if you have convictions about the Bible, you don't have a problem with having convictions about God. This message about your convictions concerning God, so I want you to listen very carefully. Because I'm going to give you a description of God by the Scriptures that God gives us. Then you have to make up your mind. Well, is this the God I know, or is this a God much greater than I know? And so I have some scriptures I want to give you in a few moments, but I want to give you the definition of conviction again so you'll remember what we're talking about. Having a conviction is being so thoroughly convinced that something is absolutely true, that you will take a stand for it regardless of the consequences. This isn't something you might believe. This is something you are willing to stand for, thoroughly convinced that it's true. What I want us to talk about is what you believe about God, what you believe in God, so that be sure that you've got that part right. Now, first of all, God is an uncreated being. He was never created. And when you read the Bible, and the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what sometimes tickles me is to hear these scientists say, yes, but out there, in space somewhere, something happened. Well, okay. Well, where did the something come from? And you, Watch this. Let's say this is God. You can't get behind God. God has always been. He has never had a beginning. He will not have an end. And there is no 
explanation for life except there is an endless eternal God. Man in all of his wisdom and all of the science and all they uh, claim to believe and know, in the beginning God. In the beginning of what? In the beginning of everything. And you can't get behind that because there's nothing behind it. And so the scripture says, for example, in, also in Psalm 90 verse 2, before the mountains were born or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting, you are God. So the first thing we have to settle is the fact there is a God. And he is an eternal God. He wasn't made. He wasn't created. He's always been. You say, well, I just, that's beyond my imagination, my comprehension. If you'll hold that right there, I'm coming to a verse that answers your question. The second thing I want you to notice about him is, not only is he uncreated, he's unchangeable. If God was just changing, I'd never know where I am, neither would you. When we say God is unchangeable in his being, that's who he is, in his perfection, and in his purposes and promises, unchanging. So when you kneel to pray, and God has made a promise in his word, he didn't, he didn't say, I've changed my mind about that. God does not change. He is everything that he is at all times. Though he has emotions like you and I have, only they are perfect. Aren't you glad he loves you? Yes. Aren't you glad that he is tender towards you and forgiving? He has emotions, but in his person, he doesn't change. Likewise, he's omnipresent. God is everywhere present. We don't have to find him. And that whole 139th Psalm uh, that speaks of that, where, about God, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I go from your presence? Nowhere. Think about this. The idea that I'm going to do something to get away from God is absolutely ridiculous. You, wh where are you going? Because everywhere is in the presence of God. Oh, we say God's here and God's there and God's over yonder. No, everywhere is in the presence of God. Because all of humanity and all of the universe and everything that God's created is in his presence. Thank God you can't get out of his presence. Amen? And so that's who he is. He's omnipresent, not over here and over there and over yonder, but everything is in his presence. For example, Jesus said in Matthew 19, 26, with God, all things are possible, which means he's, what, omnipotent, that he can do anything and everything. God has all power, but he cannot do anything that's inconsistent with who he is because he is the ultimate perfection of all that can possibly be beyond our comprehension, and he's not going to act any other way because he's God. So when we say he can do all things, he can do all things except contradict his own character. And the scripture says in Titus he can't lie, and he certainly cannot be tempted with evil because he is the ultimate of absolute goodness and perfection and truth. And there's nothing beyond that can describe him. Somebody says, well, you know, I don't know that I can get all that. If you could fully comprehend who God is, you'd get him down on your level. We'll never be able to fully grasp all that he is, but it's interesting that the Bible tells me everything I need to know about God. And so he's omnipotent. He has all power. Can't be tempted with evil. Can't be tempted to lie. And he's omniscient, and that is he knows all, listen, he knows all things about all things. Knows all things that exist and all things that happen and no surprises. Now, every once in a while somebody will say, well, I've, I've got a question. What about this? If God was God, uh, what about this? So I want you to turn to Deuteronomy 29, 29. Are you listening? Say Amen. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever that we may observe all the words of the law. What is he saying? There's some things God's not going to tell us. He says, well, I, I, before I believe God, I got to know everything. Then forget it. 
because God's not going to tell us some things. Now, think about this for a moment. Why is it that God wouldn't tell us some things? Because he knows we don't have a mind to comprehend the vastness of Almighty God and all that he has going on and is doing that we, we can't even conceive of all that. So he said the secret things belong to the Lord our God. So you say, well, I'm not going to believe in God until, until what? Until he satisfies some curiosity that you have? Well, I've, I've got some questions. Well, either get in the Bible and see if you can find them. And if you've got a question that the Bible doesn't answer, which will be strange, uh, then you just have to leave it to God. The scripture says there are some things God's not going to tell us. Now, why wouldn't he tell us some things? Because he's infinite, and we are finite, and we couldn't even understand some things. Let me ask you a question. Since he's God, doesn't he have a right to have secrets? He certainly does, and the Bible tells us that he does. Then, of course, uh, when I think about uh, all the things that God knows and all that he is, in John 1.18, uh, the Scripture says, no one has ever seen God at any time. We say, well, what about Jesus? Jesus was God in the person of a human being, a divine human being, Jesus. And in the first uh, Timothy 6.15, the only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And listen to this, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light so that no one can see him. We're talking about a God who is so far beyond anything we can possibly conceive of. Listen to that. He dwells in unapproachable light. We, we, we couldn't stand that light. But this is the same God who's a God of love. And all the power and all of his position and all the rest, the Scripture says that God is love. That is, that's one of his attributes, one of his characteristics that's who he is. God is love. This is the same God that we'll see in a few moments who's a God of justice and judgment and hates sin. He's a God of love. And his greatest expression of that is when he sent Jesus into the world. He's, the scripture says in John three sixteen, for God, so, listen to this, he so loved the world. Mm. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That is the ultimate in love that God gave his son. So which means whoever you are, you say, well, God could never love me. Why not? You can't pour God into some mold or God can do this and God can't do that. God can love the most wicked, vile sinner. And he can love the sweetest little baby. With God, love is love. And he loves you no matter who you are, no matter what you're going through. Do you remember before, how you lived before you were saved? He looked down upon us when we were sinners, and Paul describes it in his epistles. We were living in sin, and God in his grace and mercy reached down and saved us. Why? Because he is a God of absolute love. Then, of course, here's another part. And that is God's holy. Now, what does that mean? The fact that God is holy means he is separated from all sin. He's called the Holy One of Israel. God's holiness provides the pattern for us to imitate. In other words, holy means I want to live a life without sin. You say, well, nobody can live without sin. I didn't say you could. I said I want to. I, 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 I In other words, if you are committed to Jesus Christ and to his lordship in your life, your true, genuine desire is to live a holy life. And he says in Leviticus, you shall be holy for the Lord your God is holy. And so being holy doesn't mean I'm going to be perfect. But here's what it means. If I'm living a holy life, I live my life in obedience to God to the very best I know how with the help and presence of the Holy Spirit. Make mistakes, yes. Sometimes say something maybe I shouldn't say or do something I shouldn't do. But listen, 
you'll know whether you're living a holy life or not. For example, when you say something you shouldn't or see something you shouldn't look upon, and immediately, immediately you ask God, take that out of my life, or forgive me, Father, for saying that or thinking that. In other words, a holy life is not a perfect life. It is a life, watch this, sensitive to attitudes and actions that are sinful and unlike Christ. That's what a holy life is. And so we're to live a holy life. And that's why he said, be ye holy, he says, as he is holy. Holiness should be characteristic of the life of every follower of Jesus Christ. So when somebody says, are you living a holy life? I bet I can tell you what you'd say. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say it's holy. Isn't that right? Isn't that what you'd say? Mm -hmm. Because you would think to say, I'm living a holy life as best I know how, would make you sound pious and make you sound like you're better than somebody else. No. If God didn't mean for us to live a holy life, he wouldn't have said it. We are to live a holy life. And that is living a life without sin as much as is possible by the power of the Holy Spirit and still living in this flesh. So if somebody asks me, are you living a holy life? Here's my answer. As best I know how. With the help of God. So we shouldn't shy away from holiness because that's the will and purpose and plan of God for every single one of his children. It's a lifestyle that, listen, that God calls for and has equipped us to live because we have the Holy Spirit, Holy, and Holy Spirit living within us, and the Holy Spirit within us is going to do what? Enable us to live a holy life. And that's the will and purpose and plan of God. And I think we have so sidetracked that in our life, we don't even think about being holy. We just think about being a church member and getting by and doing the best I can. Listen, that best I can business just doesn't work. Right? It doesn't. In other words, the, listen, the best I can, a, a person living in sin can say that. It's not the best I can, but the best with the power of the Holy Spirit living in and through me, the best the Lord Jesus will enable me to live a holy life. And that's his will and purpose and plan for all of us. So when we think about our convictions, is that a conviction in your life? That your desire is to live a holy life? That should be a conviction. Yes, I want to live a holy life. I want to be what God wants me to be. And when I make mistakes, or if I sin, I'm, I'm going to deal with it immediately. And then, of course, uh, God is righteous. Now, what do we mean by the fact that God is righteous? Listen carefully. It means, it means that he always acts in accordance with what is right. That is, God is righteous. He always acts in accordance with what is right. And he himself is the final standard of what is right. What is right about that? For somebody says, well, I don't know what to do in this situation. God will show you what to do if you want to know what to do. And God never acts other than what is absolutely right. And watch this. He sent the Holy Spirit to live within us because he knew we couldn't do it. And he said to those disciples, I want you to sit down and wait in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high because you're not going to be able to live what you're going to, what you're going to face. You're going to face persecution and death. He already warned them. And you're not going to be able to live that life apart from the Holy Spirit. And so when we talk about living a righteous life, it's, it's living a life that is what? Doing what is right in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. A righteous life and a holy life are sort of combined there. Then, of course, God is a God of wrath. We don't like this part. God is a God of wrath. All those other things we've said are all absolutely true. He's a God of wrath. Now, what does that mean? It means that he hates Everything that is opposed to his moral character. You say, well, well, wait a minute. You said God is love. He is love. God hates anything and everything that, is, that brings his children to naught. 
He hates everything that, uh, that's sinful in a person's life. In fact, if you ask, what's the definition of wrath? The definition of wrath is, is God intensely, intensely hates sin because sin is what destroys the people he loves. He laid down his life for us. He died for us. And sin is our greatest enemy. God hates sin in every form. And so uh, he says, for example, in, in John chapter 3, uh, 36, and that, that third, people, third chapter, John, people say, oh, I love that chapter, John three 16. We'll look at the last verse. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. Look at that. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey or believe the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So people say, I believe that God is a God of love, John 3, 16. But I don't believe in, I, I think he's just a God of love, John three thirty six, And that is the wrath of God. He hates sin. You know, watch this. You know why he hates sin so badly? Because he loves us so genuinely. And he knows that wrath, he knows that sin is our enemy. Any form of sin is our enemy. And he hates sin. This God loves us genuinely, but he also hates sin. Somebody says, my goodness, the wrath of God will come upon me. And they say it sort of jesting. No, the wrath of God cannot, will not ever come upon one of God's children. Because his wrath is his hatred of sin. Therefore, once you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are a precious, precious jewel of God, and the wrath of God will never come upon you. You can't say that about everybody because uh, the, the wrath of God is coming upon some people. Now, the fact that God is a God of wrath ought to motivate us to want to win some people to Jesus. And why do we get, try, try to get the message all over the world? And thank God we, we, it's happening. And, and multitudes of people are preaching the gospel. And missionaries, are, in other words, the wrath of God will not come upon a child of God. The love of God will. So the wrath of God is limited to those who are unbelievers and who defy Almighty God. So let's think about this for a moment. God is also our judge. Now, we love all that part about love and this, that, and the other. He's likewise our judge. He says in 2 Corinthians 5, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due for the things he's done while in the body, whether good or bad. And we're talking about believers. We're not talking about the laws. That's a different judgment. All of us who are Christians one day, we will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give account of our life. Watch this. That's not the wrath of God, but we will be judged by the way we've lived. What have we done with the goodness and love and kindness and opportunities that God has given us? We will not suffer wrath, but what I want you to see here is uh, that he is our judge. And that means that I give account for the life that I've lived. Now watch this. And we could take a whole message on this, but... God will judge us on the basis of, watch this now, of how much truth I've heard, how much opportunity I've had, and what, what have I done with that truth? What have I done with that opportunity? What have I done with what God has placed at my disposal? So he's going to judge us accordingly. But it's not a judgment of unkindness and a judgment of wrath. It's a judgment of rewards we're coming to. In other words, we will be judged about the way we've lived, and we will be rewarded accordingly. And so this is not the judgment of the wicked, judgment of wrath. This is the judgment where we'll be rewarded. So when somebody says, well, I, you know, I don't know what God's going to do with me in the judgment. I'll tell you what he's going to do. He's going to love you, and he's going to reward you according to how you lived. And when somebody says, well, I've been saved, that's all that matters, just so I get there. Yeah, that's not all that matters. 
That's not all that matters at all. Because let's come to the next point. And that is, God is a rewarder. And so I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians and spend a moment or two here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, because this is a good explanation of what we're talking about. Let's begin with verse 10. According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. He's talking about preaching the gospel and somebody coming along and helping. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man or woman can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man or woman builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, each person's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire. That's God's great, awesome wisdom. And the fire itself will test the quality of each person's work. This is Paul's way of describing a judgment. If any person's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, uh, he will suffer loss. Watch this. Are you listening? Say amen. amen. But he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. So here's what he's saying. That all of us are going to be judged according to the way we live our life. Some people have great opportunities. Some people have less. Some people are just born with opportunities and gifts and talents. Other people don't. Some people are born in this part of the world. Some people are born in that part of the world. So all of these differences. At the judgment seat of Christ, God knows everything about us that needs to be known. And watch this. He's going to reward us according to the truth that we know the opportunity we have, and what we did with it. Not according to who has this, that, and the other, but how much opportunity did I have? What were my, what were my possibilities? How much talent did God give me? In other words, we can, and I, I love this verse because he says, if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire or through the judgment. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So we're children of God. And even in the judgment, the grace of God will be there and we will be judged. and not all going to be judged alike. When I think about the fact, and I was thinking about that yesterday, for over 50 years, I've had the privilege to study the Word of God for over 50 years. Primarily, number one thing in my life. Is God going to judge somebody else who never had the privilege to go to school? Maybe didn't get saved till late in life and just never had heard it before then. You think God's going to put us on the same level? No, He's not. God is a righteous God. Holy God, perfect God, loving God, just God. Hey, somebody says, what about fair? There's not a thing in the world about God being fair. God's not fair. He's holy, righteous, always does the right thing. And so uh, back to uh, our attributes of God. And that the last one is God is to be worshipped. And in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, listen to this. Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual song, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. That's what worship's all about. Now, I've just given you a little theological uh, discourse so that if somebody says, well, what, what do you believe about God? You ought to be able to tell them. And you can go right down the list. Now watch this. You ought to get this in your mind. This is not just a sermon you put on a sheet of paper and put it somewhere. You should get this in your mind. We're talking about how you think about holy God, about the God of this universe, the God who's in control of everything. This is how you think about him. And you should be willing, very courageously, boldly, gallantly, joyfully, 
say to anybody, anywhere, anytime, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yes, I believe what the Bible says. Yes, I'm serving Him. No, I can't do that because I want to live a godly life. Now, I wonder what would happen if you go to work tomorrow morning and they've gone through a big party. And I mean, they've told you what they're going to have to drink and to eat, and it's going to be this, and she's going to be there, and he's going to be there, and they're going to be dressed this way and that way and so forth. And you say, well, I can't go to that. Well, why can't you go? Well, my desire in life still is to live a holy life. What? Can you imagine what they think? First of all, they don't know what it means. But secondly, the word scares them to death. The truth is they don't want you there now because you wouldn't fit that kind of party. The truth is, listen, you and I are living in a world we don't fit in, but God has us here to make a difference, to make a difference by the life that we live and what we believe and what we're able to share with other people. That's who God is. So when somebody says to you, well, tell me about your God. You should be able to very, very courageously and boldly and thoughtfully and uh, excitedly say, I'll tell you what I believe about God. And I gave you 13 points. They're, listen, they're all true because I'm going to live and die by every one of them. And you are too, whether you like it or not, because it's the truth of God's word. It's time we stop being embarrassed for being a Christian and say, no, that doesn't fit my lifestyle. What is your lifestyle? Well, I want to live a holy life. Where did you get that from? From the Word of God. That'll be the end of the conversation. That'll be the end of it. Now you can live like the world and get by, or you can live godly and have the best. Father, we love you and praise you for your patience, your kindness, your goodness, your forgiveness, for the awesome truth that you give us in your word. And I pray that every person who hears this message would be honest enough to look at themselves and look at themselves in light of what you teach in your precious word and make a wise decision to trust Christ as their Savior. We love you, we bless you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.